Hi, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. We are so glad that you've joined us, and we're here to talk about plants and have a lot of fun. And I see some really talented folks next to me, so we're gonna find out who they are in just a moment. My name is Diane Nolan, and I teach horticulture at the <coughs> University of Illinois in the College of ACES and the Department of Crop Sciences. So let's find out who's <laughs> here, and we're gonna start first with you, Karen Ruckel. Hi. Well, what I wanted to talk about was a useful gardening aid that I find very useful, and um, it's actually a sheet, a bed sheet. So um, what I use this for is a lot of times um, pruning and hedge clipping. I used to use a tarp, but that was really hard to manipulate around the plants. Um, so a sheet, and I actually got this idea from my friend Ella, works out <laughs> so much easier. And uh, like the other day when I was doing my boxwood, I put two around the um, evergreen and then I just had everything to dump in my landscape bag. That, and it is so flexible. That's yes. really a good idea. When all of the limbs came down when we had high winds a couple days ago, I wish I had sheets all over my yard. <laughs> It would have been easier, but I think you would have had to tack them down beforehand. Impractical. Okay. Yeah. Very good tip. Thank you, Karen. Now let's go to you, Dave Plissard. Hi, I'm from Hair Nursery in Peoria, and my expertise is in landscaping and trees and shrubs. And my email question is about a pecan tree. Can I grow a pecan tree in Cary, Illinois, about 200 feet from the Fox River? Well, this is kind of interesting because. Pecan, its botanical name is Caria illinoisensis, and they're wanting to know if they can grow it in Cary, Illinois. So, oh, you are good. I just thought that was rather interesting. Yeah, you need Cary, to drop the Caria, mic now. Illinoisensis, Illinois. Anyway, yes, you probably can grow it in uh, Cary. However, you may never get any pecans. Pecans are a very long season fruit. You need almost 200 days of growing to be able to produce pecans. And in a very long year here, um, you may be able to, but uh, Cary is in the northernmost part of Illinois and you probably don't have, I don't know how many growing days you actually have, but probably not enough to produce pecans. And if, and if you did, pecans usually need two different varieties uh, to be able to produce pecans are kind of like apples where you, you need two different types of that uh, nut. So um, give it a try. It is a nice tree. It's the biggest of the hickories. Caria is the genus for the hickory. So pecan is a type of hickory. And it uh, does very well, but it just probably won't produce. Dave, that was the nicest discussion of scientific names without intimidating people. Oh, Everyone's going to remember, <laughs> Area Illinoisensis is yeah. pecan. Excellent. Yeah. Before we head on to Ella, what is your specialty, Karen? Oh, since yeah. I let you get by without <laughs> saying it, and I just realized it. Well, I'm, I'm also from uh, Hair Nursery in Peoria, and perennials, tree shrubs. Okay, I wanted everyone to know that. Okay, <laughs> now let's go to you, Ella Maxwell. Hi. Uh, I also work at Hairs because we come down as a group and uh, I sure enjoy g gardening. I'm a master gardener as well as an arborist so I can answer most of the questions. Uh, I'm answering an email today from Priscilla who writes about garden flocks and I brought some flowers here to see. But uh, her garden flocks bloomed well for 15 years but for the past four years they started out well but then she had some problems where the tops would develop a reddish tinge. She didn't see insects. They gradually dried up and she dug them all up and pitched them. But the question is, is was the problem with the flocks or with the soil? And what could she replant or should she replant in that spot? So I say there are lots of new phlox varieties of which I've brought some, and I would say that the problem was with these older variety of phlox that she had. Many of them can have um, disease problems like mildew, although that wasn't really described in her um, uh, litany of what was wrong, but uh, I think they can also get a crown rot, and that could be something that could stay in the soil, but I don't think that um, because she had that problem that it would jeopardize trying something new. And I would say, go for it. 
There are so many new phloxes. It's there are. Really, They're I beautiful. Love this variety that you brought with some of the bicolors and right, lots of strong colors. Very nice. Good. Thank you for that, Ella. And now we're going to go to the phone lines. We don't have very many people calling in, so if you have a question, give us a call. But Maggie is on the line, and she's on line two with a question about violets. Hi, Maggie. Hi. What's I your? Have, uh, I'm trying to uh, redo a flower bed that's gotten totally weed and out of control, and I'm pulling the big weeds, but there's uh, just a lot of uh, wild violets. How do I control those? How do I get rid of them? Okay. Violets are very difficult to get rid of. They, when you uh, dig them out of the ground, you always leave a little bit behind where they're gonna grow back. And uh, there are, have been some chemical treatments that you be, could use, and I don't know if it's still available for homeowners. I certainly know that a professional uh, person who treats may be able to spray them for you. Um, but the best thing in a garden is you probably are just going to have to dig them out and keep at it um, until they're gone and just accept that you, you may have to keep digging because they're, they're very difficult to remove. Um, I do have one spot that gets carried away with wild violets and I kind of have forgotten about it for a few years. But during the drought that we were having, they were so easy to pull. There was nothing <laughs> holding them in the soil. And during, after a rain, conversely, you know, they come out a little easier, but there may be something left. Yeah. So watch the spot. So it sounds like manual labor, which could be very good for, <laughs> you know, therapy. How's there that? we go. There, yeah. yeah, that's what we're gonna say. Okay, thank you for that question, Maggie. Let's go to Fran's question, and she has a watering of dogwoods question. She's on line five. Hi, Fran. Hi, thank you. Um, I, actually, I have two questions. Okay. I have a forest pansy redbud. The canopy is extremely thin this year. And, you know, we had all that rain early, and now we have not. I mean, it's mm -hmm. bone dry around here. Should I be watering it and then my dogwood? How much do I need to give them to keep them alive? Excellent they are question. Really drooping. Yeah. Okay. And, and that's, that's where. I think you've answered your own question. You know that you need to water. And most plants, uh, shrubs and trees are going to require about an inch of rain per week. That's also good for your lawn. So <coughs> that would be uh, the gauge that you want to go with. So if after 10 days we haven't, you have not received significant rainfall, then you would certainly want to water. And the neat thing with your forest pansy is if you are watering, you may have another flush of growth that will produce larger leaves. And they do say an inch a week if you can replicate that if you're not getting water. And it's so spotty this year that people need to be aware of that. Okay, well thank you for that question, Fran. And I love forest pansy red buds, those are so pretty. Let's go to Kendra's, Kendra's question on line three and it's about evergreens. Hi Kendra. Hi. Um, yeah, my question is this. Um, I live in the country, and we have evergreen trees, blue spruces and others. I planted a few blue spruces maybe eight years ago, and they're starting to die from the bottom up. They're very young. Um, I fertilize them in the fall, and I have other friends who have massive amounts of fir trees who are having to cut them down of different varieties. And we're just wondering if if there's something going on, if there's a disease, you know. Okay, you have an arborist here, so let's. Two. There, two arborists, take it away. There are, there is a disease going around, actually a couple of them that are affecting the spruce and pretty much um, making them almost useless as a tree anymore. At our garden center, we're really not selling uh, much of them anymore because of the potential. You can spray to prevent the disease or, or have it treated, uh, but it probably isn't worth it because you have to do it every year. And once you 
uh, the tree starts getting bigger and bigger, it's going to be more difficult to spray unless you have a professional uh, service treat it for you. So I would consider that and uh, if you want to protect the trees, the treatment is done in the spring, uh, usually requires two or three sprays. And um, the f bad thing about it is the infection occurs in the spring but doesn't show up almost a year later. So um, you really, this year, if there's additional infection on the tree, it may not show up and you may not be aware of it. So um, in most cases, I, I actually have quite a number of spruce trees in my yard and I'm going to be have to cutting them down. They're just getting oh, worse and worse. It's so sad. Um, I raised these from root. You mm -hmm. know, like I said, mm -hmm. they're seven, eight years old and they're just starting at the bottom. The ones on the property uh, when we bought it uh, 12 years ago are already almost gone. So mm -hmm. it, um, we heard this, but we didn't know. Um, so I should just contact like an, a tree arborist uh, for a spray because I really want to save the young ones because it's privacy. There, there are privacy. Yes, yeah, so and they can actually check to see if there's not something else going on. It may not always be uh, one of these two needle cast diseases, but uh, having someone uh, check them for you and then tell you what to do and do the treatment for you uh, would be a good way to, to proceed. Okay. And again, you might think about diversity and not have, because mm -hmm. it is the Colorado spruce more so isn't than it, any than other. Norway or correct, mm -hmm. and that's what I'm seeing. It's just mass pre-death. There's a mm -hmm. lot of them, but but they're all um, one after another. Just try to not plant the same one kind of tree. I think that will help. Even though some people like the unity, but then there's unity when they all die. Mm -hmm. So be careful. All right, there's the end of my sermon. Let's go <laughs> on to the phone lines, and we're going to go to Tony's question on line four. And it's about growing pine trees, or something about pine trees. Hi, Tony. Hey, how's it going? Pretty good. How are you? I really do enjoy your show. Thank you. Hey, my my question is, it's not, it is, yes, it is about pine trees, but it's what can you grow underneath them, because it's all bare dirt. I got an area of about 25, 30 foot by 50 foot, and nothing seems to grow there, okay? okay? Something that is a perennial that comes back every year, that's kind of what I'm looking for, and I'll just wait for you guys' answer. Okay. Well, I think each one of us can give you an answer there, Tony, because um, uh, first off, you want to make sure that you're leaving the needles because they provide a cover with that soil. And certain pines can make the soil more acidic, but most of our soils um, have a buffering capacity and that shouldn't really be an issue. I'm sure there's lots of different ground covers that would work. Um, and so those will be the ones that I'd like to name to you, but you could plant um, vinca vine, you could plant gout weed or bishop's weed, you could plant um, the, Euonymus, the creeping Euonymus. So I think there's some things you need to think that there is shade there. So Dave, got some ideas? Well, I, part of the, the issue is how dense of shade do you have? How big is the tree? How widespreading it is? I have some white pines and they're, they're fairly widespreading now. So when you get closer uh, toward the trunk, it's very dark and it's really very hard to get anything to grow. So one thing you could do to make it easier to grow is to cut off some of the lower branches so it gets a little bit lighter in there. Although um, mustard garlic grows grows very well Jeez. under pine trees, <laughs> unfortunately. Do not, do not grow that, Tony. <laughs> oh. It is a horrible weed, but uh, it is growing well under my pines, and I, <laughs> I keep trying to get rid of it, and it's a tough one, too. Yeah. Karen, evidently, think, go ahead, Karen, and then I'm going to put my two cents in. Well, I, I think a lot of times your limiting factor is it's just too dry under there, mm -hmm. and, and so you're, you're going to struggle anyway. So I would say look on the side of the tree that you are looking at, and if you can come out further in front of that evergreen, 
to plant some low shrubs or, or something that's just, you know, sturdy and, and tough because, you know, I don't even know if you've tried to dig where you think you're going to plant some of these plants, but I, I, I just I just don't see it oh, an easy thing. Excellent point. I'm in your camp, too, and, and I know that this has already happened, but if you have pines, I would say give them room and let them have those beautiful, low, draping branches and let it be a beautiful tree, you know. When I taught class, I used to say under evergreens you can plant uh, gazing balls, uh, plant, uh, chairs to benches. sit in, benches, <laughs> and astroturf. And I was tongue in cheek on the gazing balls and astroturf. But, but, uh, and if you do plant something, probably start at the drip line and try to get it to grow in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Karen's yeah. suggestion. I think that's it's real good. It's hard to dig under there. Yeah. And the pine needles look beautiful. So leave them. Okay, well, we're going to do one more uh, phone call and then go to some emails and then come back to the phone lines. Let's go to Carolyn's um, question on line five. It's about hydrangeas. Hi, Carolyn. Hi. Um, thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. Um, I have four of the Pinky Winky hydrangeas. I've had them about three years now. And this year, the leaves have got brown spots. And it's not, they're not, they got little buds on them like they want to bloom, little ones. But they're not getting big like they're supposed to. And I've been told that it was blight. Um, I don't know for sure, but that's what I've been told. And I'd like to have your advice. Okay. All right. Hydrangeas with brown spots. I think we could confirm that it could be a blight, some kind of leaf spot fungus because of the high humidity and the warm temperatures. Um, I think most of that is cosmetic and you might want to see, you didn't say how much has been affected, but um, I would be inclined to maybe increase watering and, and fertilizing and maybe watering just in the morning to keep the foliage dry and see if you can't uh, get those blooms to develop because a lot of the panicle hydrangeas do bloom a little bit later. They're just all starting to come into flower now. Yeah, I actually have a pinky winky and it's not much farther along than what you have mentioned. And so just be patient and I think you'll find that it will do, do better as the season progresses. They, in my yard, seem to be later than normal. Which is great. Mm -hmm. because then you have the oak leaves first, then you get other ones coming on later, and then Pinky Winky, everyone wants to say Pinky Winky, uh, that can be later. <laughs> okay, well good, thank you. Now, let's go to the panel. Karen, let's go to you about your, qu your email question. Yes, I have um, Carl who emailed in that they uh, live over in central Indiana, and their question is they have some eight roses, and a real old rose gets yellow spots, the leaves fall off, it doesn't die, um, but, you know, should I dig up that plant and burn it, try to find out what's going on or um, what's killing it? Well, it doesn't sound like the plant is killing it, but if it's an older plant, a, a couple things could be going on. One, if the plant's gotten really full over the years, it could be shading itself. So, you know, just that the older leaves are coming off. Two, you didn't really talk about what time of the year this was going on, but heat stress can cause the yellowing of leaves. Um, if the plant staying too wet, yellowing of leaves. Um, then what, what's kind of funny with, with the plant world too is that if it's got too much fertilizer or a deficiency in fertilizer, you can have that. Probably the biggest common cause of yellowing leaves is black spot, and that's a fungal disease that can be controlled. Uh, you can use a spray that I think is a little tough to time the spraying or a systemic control. But I would say that the plant wouldn't need to be dug up or burnt. Uh, that's only if maybe it's not flowering true to form or a disease called rose rosetta, it's a virus, and you'd want to remove that from the garden. But um, I would just, you know, some of those points I brought up with the yellowing of leaves, just experiment um, through this season and maybe next year, balancing out fertilizer, watching the watering, um, and always when you water, don't wash the plant, water the soil. Well done. Yeah. That's everyone who's got roses. There you are. Okay. Thank you, Karen. And now Dave. Well, I have a show and tell, so to speak. Here I have brought in what is called, can you 
get it on camera there, horsetail. And um, it is a primitive plant. Uh, it is a very old, old plant back to prehistoric days, so to speak. Um, and it's really a very interesting plant. If you have um, a water area or a wet area, this is a good plant to grow for that, but you do not want it to escape cultivation. Uh, you want to keep it in a pot uh, with no holes, uh, or the holes are in the bottom where it, it can escape very easily. Um, if it gets away from you, then you would be better off having violets in the yard. Even though violets are hard to remove, this, this plant's even worse because when you um, pull it out and you don't get it all, then it comes back even more. Uh, and one of the bad things about the plant is that it grows by underground rhizomes that are very deep and it is nearly impossible to get rid of it. There are not any real, real good chemical controls. So I would recommend, um, if you do use it, keep it contained. It's very interesting. Um, and if you're trying to get rid of it, accept the fact that it's almost impossible to get rid of. Wow, yeah. okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. That's well, a, and you know, I think another thing you didn't bring up is, as, as a kid, I always like taking the segments apart because yeah. they pop oh. apart. So, they do. You know, that, that's fun to do. And make another, them into little triangles. <laughs> or necklaces. Oh, no, yeah, I just yeah. like to tear them apart. Beautiful well, and floral they, design. They, uh, it has a lot of silica in it, so uh, it's actually another common name besides horsetail is scouring Scaring rush. rush. Yes, exactly. and you can actually use it to scour pots and pans. So that's kind of an interesting little <laughs> tidbit you can use. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Ella, you're next. I have an email question again. This is from Joe, and he lives in Springfield, and he has a, uh, in his subdivision, he has a detention pond or retention pond. We're not quite sure, but he has a ditch or a swale that goes to it. And again, we're not sure if it's um, emptying into the pond or if the pond, he says that it empties into the swale, but it holds standing water. And he has a cattail issue and he's considering having the cattails dug out. So uh, he wanted to know if we didn't have any suggestions, where could he go for information? So I did a little bit of uh, digging on this and you can go, uh, since you're in Springfield, the Illinois Department of Natural Resources is there, they have an office. Um, also on the website, you can visit the USDA um, Natural Resource Conservation Service and both of them have excellent uh, information in regards to bioswales, um, also into retention ponds, and different plant material that is good for wet areas. Now, if he was going to dig it out, you would probably need heavy equipment because if he started at one end by hand, my husband said that by the time he got to the end, it would have grown back at the other thousand feet. <laughs> oh but my. the idea is that you need to find out whether or not this is an area that needs to have water moved off the site because what happens with cattails and other plant materials, it clogs the, uh, the ability of it to drain correctly. So that's the first thing is that maybe you need to have a professional come in. Uh, they can put in like a, a, a geotextile and maybe some rock and then some plantings uh, on the sides that would add your color. And there's things like swamp milkweed and uh, wild bergamot and lots of different pollinator plants that would be a good addition with the moist soil. Okay, very good, thank you. Now we're gonna try to get one more question in. Let's go to Artith's question on line two about tomatoes. Hi, Artith. Hi. Uh I have a problem with my tomatoes. They're, as they start to ripen a little bit, the bottom is sort of flat, and that looks like a dry rot on the bottom. Okay. Yeah, we've, we've all experienced that. And okay. Let's it's, help her. It's blossom and rot <laughs> is what that is, and it's uh, usually a, can be a defense, deficiency of calcium, is that correct? That's and, correct. Yep. But mm -hmm. more often it's, uh, watering issues where you're not keeping the soil 
moist. It's going from one extreme to the other. And um, there are different things that you can add. Um, well, first off, mulching the tomato plants and, mm -hmm. and minimizing that soil contact anyway to your leaves helps with a lot of things. So, you When know. you go from a season where it's very wet, like, well, at least in the Peoria area this spring, uh, it started very wet in May and then uh, moved into June where it was uh, temperate and then you move into July when it's very dry and you're just kind of going back and forth in that that can affect the tomatoes. So uh, yeah, if you mulch and, and water more regularly to uh, help prevent that, we'll do a lot. Okay, so keep them evenly moist. I think that sounds great. All right, well, we have uh, just a little bit of time left and I wanna thank the viewers. You always have good questions. This really uh, captured our uh, panelists expertise today so we uh, appreciate you viewers and I want to thank you folks for being here as well so oh, thank um, you. we had all kinds of things we learned about today and uh, there's always a tomato question so I knew that <laughs> <laughs> and it's a very uneven water year so well we want to thank you so much we will see you next time have a great week gardening bye-bye